talk about uh, the course of, of the last seven or eight years at the University of Michigan and some different ways in which my own work has evolved in that time in which the work of literally hundreds of other people has, has begun to work on this. I like to start with a picture like this because this is really what learning analytics is about. Learning analytics is about students. It's about making the education system better, more vibrant, more responsive, more personalized. All these things are for them so that this will happen. Right? That's really why we're doing all this work. So let me first give you a little bit of background to set the stage. As was mentioned, I'm an astrophysicist, and I have worked for many years on measuring nothing very carefully. <laughs> um, that, was not, uh, that was my thesis project. We didn't think we were going to measure nothing, but we did. Uh, so then I changed career directions, since there was nothing there to measure, and, and moved to uh, doing big data cosmology. And in big data cosmology, the kind of general effort was to measure everything, or as much of everything as you possibly could. So we worked on doing that, measuring hundreds of millions of galaxies in projects like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the Dark Energy Survey, in which I worked on gravitational lensing and, and galaxy clusters and things like that. Along the way, we also did a bunch of work looking for very rare things, looking for the needle in the haystack rare explosions in space. So lots of different kinds of elements of data science. And I would say the most important part of my own technical background for this work in learning analytics is that it was all observational science. You don't get to make new galaxies or galaxy clusters in the lab, right? So if you're going to learn anything about causality in astrophysics, you have to do it with observational data. And a lot of that is true for education as well. There are times when we do and should do real experiments in education. But most of the time, we're just engaged in practice and trying to learn from that in a quasi-observational way. So I think that's important. I've always loved data. And so when I became the director of our honors program, which I'm actually not anymore, but I, I was until last summer, um, I realized I knew nothing at all about what was happening on our campus, except maybe in my own class. And it was kind of problematic to be in charge of this program with thousands of students in it and not know what was going on. So I looked around, realized the campus had a lot of data, and I said, could I have it? And the campus said, OK. And so I was able to get access to you know, most of the student data that existed and start working on it. And that's what led me to get involved in this work. So what is learning analytics? It's uh, you know, an interesting phrase that emerged around 2010. And the most common version of it that people use is this one. It's the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. And I like almost everything about this, except perhaps the optimizing bit. That's a pretty, there's a little hubris in that. I would say improving would be plenty for me, right? But otherwise, I think it's really great. These ideas like measurement is really important. The collection of data is really important. Reporting, all these pieces are important. So why are we doing it now? Um, the 20th century started with an industrial revolution. And public higher education on your campus and mine responded to that, exploded in scale. We grew from 3,000 students to 48,000 students in 30 years. Right, an incredible period of time. We did that by using the techniques of industrialization, uh, a, a set of bureau bureaucratic things that we now are so embedded in our system that we can't imagine living without them. Credit hours and grades and all that stuff. We didn't have grades at Michigan until 1912. Right? People were passed or not passed. No one was failed. Right? Totally different system. Worked fine for our first you know, 100 years. <laughs> um, but now it's inconceivable, right? So the fact that change occurs is important to remember. So when we teach at scale right now, we mostly pursue this kind of form of optimization, what I would call an industrial form of optimization. We try to create one system that is optimized for the median student, right? Get the best system, and then make everybody go through it, right? Imagining that perhaps they're all the same, but of course they aren't. But we live in a different era now. We live in a time of an information revolution. And consequently, we know more about our students than we ever have. And we can connect with them, and we can connect them with information in ways that were impossible 20 years ago. Right? So it is time for there to be a new revolution in higher education, one that is driven by this information revolution. And I think the goal in the 21st century, instead of the kind of optimization we used in the 20th century, it should be instead adapting the system to meet every student where they are. Instead of saying we have one system, we'll try to cram all the students into it. Right? 
different kind of optimization. So this is, I think, the big picture that's driving all of this work, and it's the place where I think there's so much, why I think there's so much promise for it. So why, do, why should we personalize? We've actually known this from education research for quite a long time. This famous paper by Benjamin Bloom in 1984 um, recognized what he called the two sigma problem, right? That if you teach people in a conventional way, you get some kind of general distribution of outcomes. If you do a little better and you really push on mastery learning, it can get better. But if you can personalize, if you can work one-on-one -on -one with every student, you can get outcomes that are two sigma different from normal instruction. This is the famous two sigma problem. So it's been known about for a long time, and in that era, people tried certain kinds of personalization, but ones that didn't work at scale. In that paper, he has this great quote that I really like. Teachers are frequently unaware of the fact that they are providing more favorable conditions for learning for some students than they are for other students. Generally, they are under the impression that all students in their classes are given equality of opportunity for learning. <coughs> So he's recognizing that when you create that kind of industrial system, you're actually setting the game up so that some people will succeed and some people won't. And unless that's your intent, you probably shouldn't do that, right? But I think it is the way the system runs right now, okay? So why personalize for me? This is my class two days ago. I told them I was coming to, uh, coming to talk at Berkeley and I said, would they say hello to Berkeley? So they did, they waved. This is actually one third of my class because there are 735 of them, they don't fit in the room, so they come three times in a row. All right. Now, most of my teaching career, I treated this as a bunch of faces that were all the same, because I didn't know what else to do. I didn't have any other way to do it. But now I have come to recognize that it's essential that we remember that every one of these people is an individual, and we want to find powerful ways to respond to that. So for example, uh, there's a student right up here. I left it blurry deliberately. Okay, there's a student right up there who was an art student until last year, and now she's decided she's gonna be a physics student. Right, really cool. There's a student down here who's in the Air Force ROTC. She comes to class after two hours at the gym at 9 a.m., right? Every student is a different person coming from a different background. There's a kid up here who comes from Northern Michigan, a school that had no AP classes, right? He's in a different place from everybody else in the class, and if we don't respond to that in any way, we determine the outcomes before we start, so. That's what drives me. So what can analytics do? The main thing that analytics do for us is gather up records of past student experiences and their behaviors and their outcomes and everything we might learn and allow us to learn from that prior experience, right? So we look at this data of what happened before and we learn something from it, all right? Now, when will that analytics be particularly useful? That analytics will be particularly useful in some cases, but not in many other cases. In order for learning from experience to be useful, that prior experience should be extensive, the data you have about it should be really accurate, and it should be really relevant. And what I mean by that is, if you take data about a prior experience and then you change everything in the circumstances, there's no reason to believe that what you learned before will generalize to the future, right? So you wanna think about places where you will have extensive, accurate, and relevant data. So let me say just a word about that. On our campus at Michigan, we have 9,200 courses. Um, and the vast majority of those courses are what I would call artisanal courses. They are handmade by individual faculty members. They're taught in really idiosyncratic, engaged ways. They tend to be very close to the research expertise of the faculty member. Right? They're teaching about the stuff they really work on. And consequently, that influences both course content and their pedagogical approach. In these courses, I would say instructors actually know a lot about what they're doing. And they may not need a lot of help from analytics in order to do that well. When we go and try and, in a sense, force analytics on an environment where it feels very unnatural, we create resistance that doesn't need to exist, right? So backing off from that idea, it's not that analytics is gonna come in and do everything, of course it's not, right? Backing off from that idea can be a big help. There are, however, places, about one or 2% of the list of classes on our campus are large and relatively stable. They tend to be taught in these industrialized, remote ways almost always by tradition more than by design, right? We teach introductory physics the way we taught introductory physics 70 years ago. In fact, we use the same book. It's been through three generations of authors, and I don't mean just three generations, I mean three generations of them have died. <laughs> All right? So, I mean, maybe that's the right thing to do, but that's the way it is. And often, when people are teaching these large foundational courses, they're not teaching about the thing they're really research specialists on, right? So they're not bringing any of that to the table. They just come in and plug in and do what they, what, 
what's been done. So I would say most courses on our campus already have what they need to be excellent. That's not to say they're all excellent. But they don't need analytics coming in and telling them what to do. But there are many places that do and will benefit enormously from this. Or at least these are the places we should focus first, these kind of large foundational courses. What are the challenges for doing learning analytics? The first thing is that we have to learn to know every individual student, and in all the relevant ways. So right now, our data systems contain a lot of data about students, but they may not contain the right data. Right? It, one big problem with analytics is that people like to just take the data that's there and run with it as if it tells them everything they need to know. We need to stop and think about measurement. Are we really learning the things we need to know about students? And if we're not, we need to work on that. Right? Then once we know every individual student in all these relevant ways, we have to learn how to react to that. What are we going to do about it? Right? How to respond dynamically to difference in our learning environments. Who should be doing this work? I think the we is everybody who's involved in, 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 in educating our students, so faculty, staff, administrators, but also the student themselves. The student themselves has a lot to learn from all this. If you think about what a student knows from the experience of other students, it's usually limited to the two or three people who happen to be older than them that they talk to. Wouldn't it be great if they could learn from the experience of all students who'd come before in this kind of way, right? They could get a much better rounded idea of what's going on. I think of all of this work as, as as educational R&D, right? There's a real research part where we would learn about the science of learning, but there's an enormous amount of interaction with practice where we're really trying to develop an environment and make it optimal. We have not done R&D in our educational mission very much. We just go out and teach, right? And that's hard to defend. So this educational R&D thing is also not a problem to be solved. It's a permanent task. Right? Because even if we figured out how to do even that optimal word of teaching right now in our current circumstances, those circumstances are changing like crazy. Students are totally different from 10 years, well, they're not totally different, but they're different in some important ways from 10 years ago, and 10 years from now they will be again. So we can't just get it right, we have to keep it going. Permanent process. Okay. So where should we do educational R&D? The ideal research environment to me would have a steady flow of a large number of diverse students who we know really well and engage with for a long period, right? You'd really like to have subjects that you understand really well. You'd like to have a wide array of richly instrumented activities that don't just change from day to day, but are evolve gradually so you can really study them up and get to know them. You'd like to have a bunch of interdisciplinary research experts around to do it. And you'd like all of this to take place within a community of trust, the kind of space where we are integrating research and practice, and the people we're teaching who are part of the practice understand that they're in a research environment as well, in the same manner that you might when you go to a teaching hospital. And you know that they're actually doing research with the patients that they're working with. People choose to go to such a hospital because they get the latest methods work to work with them, right? I think our educational environment should feel like that too. And needless to say, you know, when you look at this list, uh, what it reminds you of is public research universities like Michigan and Berkeley. If we don't do this work, who's going to? Right? There are lots of places that have lots of students, but they don't have as large a set of interdisciplinary research experts. Right? I mean, we are the people who should be doing this work. So I hope you will take that to heart. OK. In order to frame what we've been doing at Michigan, I want to talk about our story in learning analytics. And I'll give an introduction. I'll talk about some examples of the things we've been doing and try to reflect on, on the challenges we've had to overcome in order to get there. Okay. So let me start back around 2006, so just about a decade ago. Before that decade took place, there was something that's very rarely acknowledged but absolutely central to doing learning analytics. We have a giant IT organization on our campus like you do. Most faculty members don't interact with it very much on our campus, probably the same here. Um, they did a tremendous amount of incredibly valuable work before we ever got involved. They created a data warehouse in 1996 on our campus and began very carefully, very professionally storing and retaining all the data about our students. So that when we started this work, there was a 10-year history of data that we could go to work on. Right? Very important, essential part of it quasi-invisible. What happened around 2006 is that a bunch of different faculty members started to poke their nose into this space. And I would call out my colleague Gus Everard in physics, who created an amazing thing called the Academic Reporting Toolkit 1.0. And I'll tell you about 
its, its progeny, Academic Reporting Toolkit 2.0. Stephanie Teasley started looking at the usage data inside our learning management system and thinking about how you could put that to work. And I started to work on introductory physics courses because that's what I teach. Right. What grew out of those efforts was an emergent faculty-led campus-wide com conversation. And we realized that the way faculty usually do, we started a seminar series. Right? You got something going on, you got to talk about it. So we started the Symposium on Learning Analytics at Michigan. And you know, the way we set up the schedule is that each of us talked the for the first three talks. And then we like looked around for other people who would talk and, and found that there were people. And we invited in some outside people. And that really helped us to, to make the conversation start in a space that was not connected, in fact, to the, to the administration of the campus. It was really growing out of the campus. It was much more organic. In 2012, I spent some time with our provost talking about this learning analytics work. Phil Hanlon at the time was a mathematician. He's now the president at Dartmouth. And he thought this was a really good thing for us to get involved with. So he asked us to create a task force, a faculty-led task force that ran for three years from 2012 to 2015. And he put money behind it. He gave us money to support learning analytics projects so that teams of people all over campus could say, I have a thing I want to investigate or I want to try and build, and they could get some support for it. That was a very important part of this. The first, the first uh, charge for this task force was to think about how to open access to the data, how to make sure that people who should have access to data can get it with as little effort as possible. Right? At the same time, of course, we're thinking about who should have access to data, and for what, and how. Right? So it allowed us to reconsider all the governance practices that we had around data. Our governance practices were basically inherited by tradition. Different programs owned different pieces of data just because they generated it, not because it necessarily made sense for, that to, for it to be that way. But there were data stewards all over campus, none of whom really knew what they were supposed to do in terms of giving access to data, so it created a lot of confusion. In addition to that work on governance, we ran this, learning, this Exploring Learning Analytics Grants program. We gave people money to do projects. And that, proved incredibly fruitful because it got a lot of activity going. And then we were also supposed to do some community building, so we created a Learning Analytics Fellows program, which essentially met as an on-campus class for two hours a week during a semester. And a faculty member and a graduate student would come together as a team with a project they wanted to do. They would learn about the data, the access they could get. Um, a lot of these people had to learn for the first time about human subjects research and things like that. right? I mean, it's not that that's impossibly hard or anything, but if you come from physics, you know, I never had to go to the IRB to study galaxies, right? I just go look at them. They don't have privacy rights or anything, right? Um, so I had to learn about this stuff, too. Um, that le led, actually, to the production of a practical learning analytics MOOC, which is out there on the edX platform if you ever want to look at it. It's basically what we did for our fellows program. Okay. As this task force came to an end, we had to think about how to institutionalize the progress that we had made. And I'm going to tell you much more about the details of this. We did some work on rationalizing our data on campus. We created some institution-wide research practices and goals. And we created this digital innovation greenhouse. And I'll give you the details of those as we go on. OK. I want to split this up into several different themes. We're doing learning analytics, I think, ultimately with the goal of personalizing education in a, in a, in a more thorough way. And so some of the things that we face when we do that include ethics. So I'll talk first about that. Also, measurement. What, are, what, are we, what have we measured? What would we like to measure? And then there are kind of two ways you put data to work. You can either do analysis of the data to learn something about what's going on, or you can take the data and actually try to put it to work, supporting decision making, creating the motivation for change in people, and building a kind of learning lab. So I'm going to talk about these four topics. Let's first say something about ethics, about what it is we think we're doing and why we're doing it. There are lots of ethical questions to explore in this space, I think. Um, there's a general set of things around the principles that govern the collection of and use of data about any individual in any space, right? But this is a special space. If we're going to work in the education space, students come to us wanting us to know a lot about them in at least many ways. We, they want us to look closely at what they're doing, at what they're learning, and to provide the feedback on that, on that work. So there's a kind of community of trust thing going on that is paralleled in some ways to the way you work with healthcare providers. Right. I think about that, that parallel a lot, that teaching hospital learning space uh, a lot. So we need to think about what are the right norms of consent for work that we might do, for privacy, who, who owns the data, 
I mean, I don't even like to use the ownership word quite, but who has autonomy to act in this data space? So we need to think a lot about these kinds of questions. And the community around learning analytics has been doing this in a bunch of ways. Um, one way is that there were, have been two meetings run down at Asilomar about this in 2014 and 2016 that particularly aimed to think about learning research in higher ed and about the data and records in this digital era. And this produced some interesting things. The goal that we had was to generate some principles, not rules, but principles that might guide the way we think about this. And they end up being very much in the spirit of the Fair Information Practices Code of 1973 or the Belmont Report that led to IRBs and everything else, right? So just going back to the roots of this and thinking about what those principles are. So at Asilomar, we talked about six different main principles that might govern the way we think about learning analytics. The first is respect for the rights and the dignity of learners. This means being very transparent about what's going on. These people have a right to be involved and to know what's happening, protecting their privacy. So respect for the rights of learners. Beneficence is a central part of this, right? We are doing research and development to improve the education of our students, not to earn a profit or anything else, right? So if it is not benefiting the students, we shouldn't be doing the work. Another side of that, though, is justice. We live in a system that is not always just. And if we don't analyze and examine it, we may not know that. We may allow injustice to continue. So we may have an obligation to do research to find out whether our systems are really just. And then we wanted our, our work on learning analytics to be open. Uh, we would like, as researchers in public universities and universities, to make this research a public good, to, to remember that learning is a very humane process. And so we need to think about how to keep that part of the system, not to search for solutions that erase humanity from it. And then the last point is about continuous consideration, just the notion that this, the ground under this is changing day by day. And if you think about the Internet of Things or anything else, it's clear that it is, right? So we will not come up with principles that will guide us for the next decade, right? We have to continuously think about this. One of the things that's emerged in the learning analytics field for me is an interesting question about where to have this conversation. Because, you know, we reflexively turn to the scholarly literature and we want to write a paper on ethics and learning analytics and put it in some journal. But, you know... That isn't always the best way to have a broad conversation, and certainly not one that's vibrant and, and open. So I'm spending a lot more of my time doing writing and thinking in other kinds of spaces than the academic space. And so I want to give you two different examples of that, of these kind of ethical principles. One is a conversation that I've been having with lots of people about the use of language around predictive modeling. So it's very common in the, in the world of learning analytics to talk about predictive modeling. And um, I find that language problematic. And so I would like instead for us to talk about learning from experience, as I mentioned before. We look at what happened in the past that could provide guidance for what would happen in the future, could be predictive, if we don't change anything or if nothing changes underneath us, right? But as educators, I think our goal is to learn from the past in order to change the future rather than just to predict it, right? So I would like to have us speak in a different way about this. And I think it would be helpful if we did the whole community doesn't agree with me, or not the whole community agrees with me, but I'm going to keep pushing on that idea. So that's one example. Another example of what drives us from these ethical principles is probing inequality, right? So the idea that we should be examining our learning environments and deciding what we think about whether they're creating equal opportunity for everyone to succeed is very important. And so I've been writing about this too. And you can see these are, you know, these are pages from a blog post, right? So thinking about other ways of getting messages out than the scholarly literature. And I think, for me, too often we have assumed that the right mode of fairness in higher education is identical treatment. And I just don't think it is, right? So, all right. So that's some stuff about ethics. Let's talk about measurement for a bit, about data collection and management. Um, I love to measure things. I'm a physicist. So this is a part of it that I really actually enjoy quite a lot. What do we measure about our students? So every university in the United States, at least, measures a bunch of standard student record information that's needed for reporting, it's needed for running the operation. So we have admissions information about all our students. We know in quite good detail exactly every course they took, who they took it with, who they took it from, where they took it, when they took it, all that kind of stuff. We know what grade they got in the course. We may not know anything else about what happened in the course, but we know that. And then we know about degrees and honors, right? So this is student record stuff. It may seem a little dull, but there's actually a tremendous amount of information here. What we're starting to do now 
is to record both the process and products of learning in much richer ways. So ever since things like learning management systems appeared on campuses, it became the case that much more of education is digitally mediated. Assignments are given to students and turned in by students through these systems that often the assignments themselves live on long after the course exists. And so there is a body of information about the, the process of learning, what people are doing when they're learning, and the products of learning, what do they actually produce at the end, that we could be studying. All right. um, even at our campus, this kind of work is very early, in very early stages, but it's, there's a lot of promise for it in the future. What I think we want to have is a relevant, evolving portrait of every student's background, interests, goals, and accomplishments. We should know that student as well as possible, and we should use it to help students and faculty, administrators, staff, everybody understand and improve higher ed. So that's kind of the goal. Um, when we started this work, we had a giant data warehouse, very professionally run, also incredibly complicated. If you create a data system to run a live organization, it will be incredibly complicated. It must be, because it evolves organically. You're adding new things all the time as new processes emerge. It has to be like that. So the data description manual, when I started this work, was 157 pages of these tables. And I didn't actually mind, because you know I'm a data person. So just give me access, and I'll figure it out. right? But that's incredibly rare. So we needed to do work on our data in order to make it accessible and useful for more of the campus. So we, we started a project to do that that's called the Learning Analytics Data Architecture. And you could go to our ITS pages right now and see these pages. They're all publicly open. What LARC is, is it's a research-focused data set containing information about students who've attended the University of Michigan since approximately 1996. Right? What we did is to go through that complex data warehouse and produce something that looks and feels a little bit like a data release. Right? Clean it all up so that every column in that data set, we've done our best job to fill in the correct information there and labeled in a sensible way. Right? So that a researcher could come in and use that data much more easily than if they had to go into our data warehouse. It accounts for things like the fact that the way we might record that you were in the honors program changed over the years. And if you just go in the data warehouse, you'd have to learn that expertise, right? But we've cleaned all that up. The reason we did this, actually, it grew out of my experience in big data cosmology. So projects like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or the Gaia Space Mission have the same issue. Inside the project, incredibly complicated data, data warehouse that they have to have to run the project. But then when you want to make a public release of data, you have to clean it up to make it usable by the people on the outside. So they've always had that kind of process. The other thing I would say about LARC is in addition to it being um, a data set, it's also a process so that each term, we not only add a new term to that data set, but we can also enrich the process that pulled all the prior data and add new features to it, right? We can make it better as time goes on, and that, that's happening too. Putting this data in one research data set also made it much simpler to think about researcher access. Because now there was one thing you were asking for. We knew what it was you were asking for. It's right there. And so it allowed us to create a process for getting access to LARC that was much simpler than what we used to have. So that was a big accomplishment of our ITS organization. All the experts of the data system came together to do this. They deserve enormous amount of credit for, for doing this difficult work. OK. Now, once you have all this information, you have to think about how you might release the information in it while protecting personal privacy. So it, it would be great if a student or a faculty member could come and ask a question about what we could learn from experience and get the answer, the information, without digging down into the personal information of anybody, right? So not exposing privacy questions. And there's two big approaches that we've been taking. One is a set of what I would call restricted reporting tools that provide access to, to digested information so that the, the framework itself can make decisions about where it has to draw the line to not release any personal information, but can still release a lot of information to the campus. And I'll talk about both ART 2.0, this academic reporting toolkit, and eCoach. The other big approach that we've been using extensively is existing research protocols, right? So we have a very powerful system on campus for overseeing human subjects research. And so this is what we use in LARC. Anyone who wants to do a project starts by going to the IRB to get their project approved. Then they write an MOU with the, with the university. Very simple, but, but you know, relying on those research protocols. Very often, they can do their work with anonymized data. Sometimes they can't, and if they really can't, they can get identified data so that they can merge it with something else. Right? But uh, very often, they can do it with anonymized data. There are a lot of interesting new approaches emerging in data science, so it's great that you have people from the data science world thinking about this. We've done some work with synthetic data 
producing synthetic data that contain all the information that's present in the real data, but none of the real data. So there's no individual privacy concerns at all associated with that, although there are what I would call institutional privacy concerns. So there's two kind of players here. There's the individual who might worry about you looking at their data. And then there's the institution who might not want anyone to know what's happening on their institution. Um, you know, I'm kind of the, the kind of person who doesn't think public institutions have privacy rights like that. Um, uh, I work in one and I'm trying not to uh, uh, unsettle people too much, but I want to lean that way because, you know, we're public institutions and I think it's important for us to be as open as possible, right? And a lot of the resistance is, is not about, you know, some very high-minded goal, frankly. It's about people just not wanting anyone to know what's going on and uh, that's, that's not okay. Okay, so we also would like to make better measures of learning. Right now, our principal measure of learning on our campuses is grades, as I said, invented in the 20th century, more or less. I would call them aggregated performance measures of unrecorded tasks meant to estimate unknown outcomes quantified on some ill-defined scale. <laughs> right? We just don't even know what they mean, right? If you go to the ed school they will, and, you, and you use grades as an outcome, they're like, no, you can't do that, which is pretty striking. <laughs> So, uh, so we should be thinking about how to measure learning better, and I think we have lots of ways in front of us to do this. There's lots of straightforward stuff that people are starting to do now, kind of simple pre and post testing of various kinds, and if you have simple learning goals that you can you know, set up that way, that, that can be very effective measure of growth. Very interesting stuff coming in the future, though. Um, since you can see both the process and product of learning, you can imagine trying to elicit from all of that data richer information about what's happening with student learning. I'll give just one example. Um, we think that teaching students to write is one of the central elements of liberal education. And they do a tremendous amount of writing. Actually, they do quite a various amount of writing. Some do a lot. Some do very little. Right? And we would really like to know, how does their writing advance from their first year to their fourth year? Now pretty much all of that writing is sitting in a data warehouse. We could process it to try and understand what is the nature of student writing doing as they evolve through their curriculum. How is that happening for students in different programs, right? And we would be asking a question about whether our programs are leading to the outcomes we want to have, right? And we would do that with natural language processing kinds of approaches. So lots to come with better measures of learning. I think a lot about also about measuring what matters. So right now, if you look at an academic transcript, it has this list of classes and pretty much a single number, a GPA, right? And that GPA drives so much of the activity on campus, it's really grotesque, right? How hard people work to maintain their GPA. I think we should be thinking about a transcript of the future in which we try to reflect on the things that we think really matter in a liberal education in some way. So we're, we've got this project going on to try to realize versions of this where we think about measuring things like intellectual breadth and disciplinary depth, and that's not a trade-off. You could be very intellectually broad and very disciplinarily deep. It's not one or the other, right? The range of experience. We all think you should have different kinds of experiences. If you just go to lecture classes for your four years in college, you know, you're kind of missing out, right? So how could we recognize that you know, range of experience? You're doing internships, you're doing different things. Engagement, effort. I know that the students on our campus put in wildly different amounts of effort during their four years, but we don't record that on the transcript. Uh, we do it in, you know, sub rosa ways, like if you major in one thing, we might think, well, that one's hard, you know what I mean? But it would be really nice to actually do it. Networks are also very important. We think that it's important that students come to a residential campus so they will meet and interact with lots of different kinds of people, right? So are they doing that? Who's doing it well? Who's not? How could we learn about that? And then, of course, it's not crazy to look, ac look at academic performance, but it should be in the lower right, not in the upper left, okay? So I just want to mention one piece of work that was done by one of my senior thesis students thinking about the student's network of connection. And, you know, there's lots of great work going on in the world of networks, social networks, and so on. Here we have a network that is, that is very well measured, but is perhaps not very representative of a student's deep experience. We know every course everybody's taken and who's taken them with them. Right, very good records of that. That's one of the things we get right. And so we can look at course co-enrollment. It is a really well-measured, very large, bipartite network. So every student is up here on the top and they are connected to other students through courses. And every course down here is connected to other courses through students. So you can use that network to understand how students are connected to students through courses and how courses are connected to courses through students. 
right? Really interesting stuff you can do when you get, get into this. What we did was to compare the, the measured network structures for our students to appropriate random graphs to get some kind of measures of the diversity of connection. And um, I'll just show you one simple result from Carr Epker's thesis. Um, different majors are differently isolated. The most isolated major at the University of Michigan is musical theater. We have a great musical theater program. It admits 24 students a year. They sing and dance together for four years, and they go to Broadway. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, and, that, and that's what they're there for. So if you look at them, they all have this isolation measure way up here, right? Except for one of them. A joint English and musical theater major. So you see, the measure like this you know, sees real things. Then there's philosophy, right? Philosophy is a little broader. Uh, and this is a philosophy pre-med. Okay. And then we have a general studies major on our campus, which is the least restricted major on campus. And um, although there is a, a, a large group of general studies students who stay, take courses together, there are some general studies students who are less likely to take courses with general studies students than they are to take courses with other people. They're like pushed away from the other general studies students. It's really interesting. So anyway, we're just exploring this space now. And um, I think we're going to learn a lot of interesting things from this kind of view. So new kinds of measurement can be really valuable. OK. So we talked about, uh, about ethics. We talked about measurement and data. I want to talk about two different ways we put the data to work. The first one is, is, is simple and most familiar, just analysis, trying to learn from experience. And I'll just give, give two quick examples of projects led by faculty members on our campus. The first one is uh, about placement exams. So we have these placement exams we give to students when they arrive. And their goal is to put people into the right starting point so that they'll be successful, right? Very well-intentioned. Also, almost utterly unexamined before we did this work, right? So the idea is we want to start you here, we want to start you here so that you'll be more successful later on. It's an easy thing to examine, but it hadn't been examined very much. So one of my colleagues in chemistry, um, Ginger Schultz, who is a chemistry education researcher, wrote a really nice paper about this. At Michigan, we have a weird system that puts a lot of students directly into organic chemistry. They come from high school chemistry, and they take these placement exams. If they get good scores on these placement exams, they go straight into organic chemistry. If they don't, they go into one semester of general chemistry, and then into organic chemistry, and then on to another general chemistry class. Okay? This is a Michigan model. They made it up in the 90s. Everybody's proud of it. right? But it, it hinges on this. right? It hinges on this placement exam for deciding who should go where. And the idea is sending people here should help them later. That's why we're doing it, right? So we should examine how much it helps them. It turns out that because this is based on a placement exam score, there is a quasi-experimental design built into this that is called regression discontinuity. All right. So the idea of this analysis was to look at the chemistry placement rating. And students who are on this side of the graph were told to go straight to organic chemistry. Students on this side of the graph were told to take general chemistry first. right? And then we examine the outcome in a later course in that, that uh, fourth semester physical chemistry course. All right? And what you can see is there's a relation between chemistry placement and, and score in that later class. right? And that that relation, relation has what's called a regression discontinuity at this point. So people who take this advised general chemistry class, actually their line is boosted above the line of people who don't take it. Right? This is the gain of taking that general chemistry class. Now, it's great that we can see a gain, because there was supposed to be a gain. right? The size of that gain is quite small. So it is about less than 0.2 letter grades. Now, that's, it's a real gain. It's statistically significant to everything else. Um, but it's not huge. And taking a whole semester of general chemistry is a big decision. It costs money. It costs time, right? So if you're really enthusiastic about chemistry, maybe you should just charge ahead and struggle a little more, but be on a faster path, right? So this has modified the way people think about the advising around this. It's not like, I mean, I think the past view was, if you don't take general chemistry, you just fail those other classes. But that's not true, right? So we should be careful in thinking about that. So this is a place where we learned a lesson like that. The second example of analysis that I want to talk about is, is one of our own. Um, it's what started me working on this stuff, thinking about whether courses are equitable. So the very first question we asked when we were thinking about physics was, um, how should we understand our students' performance? 
Should we just look at the grade they got? And if you got an A, you did well. If you got a C, you did poorly. Or should we do that in the context of who they are and where they're coming from, right? Should we see whether they do better or worse than expected rather than just whether they do well or poorly? I knew from talking to many, many students that that's the way they think about it, right? If a student is a 4.0 student and they get a B plus, you know, Professor McKay would say, good for you, that's good grade in physics. And they would say, that's a disaster and I'm never taking physics again, right? Because it's relevant that it's relative to what they're used to doing. So we started to look at how do people perform in our classes compared to how they perform in their other classes. And so we just measure their GPA in other classes and then look at their grade in this Physics 140 course. And what we found is there's a very strong relation between those two things. There's a lot of scatter in that relation, right? That's the, what's shown by these dashed lines. That's the scatter for individual students. But we know these means extremely well because there are 28,000 students in this figure, right? So this is the mean for students at every different GPA. So that tells us about students in general. <clears throat> we could then start to split it up and say, who does better and worse than expected based on other kinds of parameters, not just this GPA and other classes. Some of those parameters we might expect to be predictive, maybe ACT math score, and some of them we don't expect to be predictive. And one of them that we don't expect to be predictive is, is gender. So if we look at gendered performance difference in this class, we now have two sets of points up the middle. One set of points, these lighter colored points, represent the grades for male students who come in with these GPAs and other, other classes. And the darker points represent the grades for female students. Okay? Students who come in with the same kind of otherwise academic performance don't perform the same in this class. And that difference is substantive. So the difference between this line here and the average grades that students get is 0.3 letter grades for male students. It's 0.6 for female students. So it's quite substantial. We since have discovered that this kind of gendered performance difference exists in all of our large introductory science and math lecture classes and economics one and two. We went to look at other campuses and found that same pattern exists on four other major public research university campuses. So there's a thing here that we need to think about. I'd be happy to talk more about that with, with people if they want. OK, so these differences remain when we account for everything we know about background and preparation, looking at the different courses that people take, looking at their ACT test scores, their high school GPA, everything. We throw everything in to try and explain it, because I would actually like to explain it. I don't want it to be true. Right? I don't want it to be my fault, but I think it is. All right. It's not present in lab classes. And I think that this kind of unexplained performance difference is a sign of classroom inequity. There's something wrong in the class that we have an obligation to try and fix it. OK, so those are some analysis examples. Let me tell you about action, about putting data to work in various ways to support decision making and motivating change. So in order to put this data to work, we have built an organization called the Digital Innovation Greenhouse. And it lives within an, a unit at Michigan that's called the Office of Academic Innovation. The Office of Academic Innovation has three different labs in it. One of them is called the Digital Education Innovation Lab. It is involved in MOOC production and study. The second is the Digital Innovation Greenhouse. And the third is a Gameful Learning Lab. We're doing a lot of work with Gameful Learning on campus, and it's very exciting. I'm going to tell you mostly about DIG and what it is and how it works. DIG was born to solve this problem that kept coming up on campus. A faculty innovator would create some kind of tool that makes education better, more personal or engaged, right? something that works. And their research team would test that thing and show that it really works and get it ready to spread. And then they would run into what people call the entrepreneurial valley of death. There's a huge difference between an invention and a product, or between an innovation and infrastructure. And the people who create the innovation are usually not able to carry it across the gap to infrastructure. They don't have the skills. They don't have the interest. They're not rewarded for that. So in the world of business, people create business accelerators that have the innovator come in and then allow that innovator to work with a team of people who can help them mature the idea, also can do the kind of discovery of what the world really wants. Is it the thing we built, or do they want something different? Right? In the business world, you'd call that customer discovery. In education, you might talk about working with a community of practice who's using the tool. It's really the same task, though. So we needed a way to cross that gap, a nurturing place to mature these things and spread them. We decided to call it the Digital Innovation Greenhouse instead of a business accelerator, because on my campus, frankly, most of the campus doesn't like business terminology. Right? An, an accelerator sounds scary. A, um, 
An accelerator sounds scary, a greenhouse sounds very nice. So you bring your things in as seedlings and they grow up and uh, they cross-pollinate, you know, and you give them organic food and you plant them in a sunny field, with you, right? all of those kind of things. So how does this work? It starts with the university teaching community who invent something and bring it into the greenhouse. Those innovators come in and work with us. Within the greenhouse, we have a team of developers and user experience designers and behavioral scientists. They work with the communities of practice that are actually using these tools. And this is a huge benefit. We get to work with the people who are using it as we develop it. Right? That's really important that we should be able to do that. Eventually, these tools grow up and they come out to be supported at scale by university IT. Maybe some of them become startups or go off to university consortia like Unison and so on. This is what we conceived of when we started it in, in May of 2015. What we've added to it is something we didn't imagine. Once you create this environment where there's so much work going on in the in practice of education, and it's so well instrumented, you can do a tremendous amount of research in that space. And so we've bolted onto the side of this operation externally research funded stuff that's going on and leading into the scholarly world. And it's because it's all happening here, it's really easy to come in and do experiments in that kind of environment. So that's been an important development for us. It was born in May of 2015, just three people underneath a, 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 a parking ramp in a garage, because that's where you start. <laughs> that's how it always starts in a garage, right? You can see the, uh, the developer Coca-Cola on the table, right? All that stuff. Uh, now we live on top of the library at, at, uh, in the center of our campus. And it's become a much bigger operation. You can see we have this really nice, giant open space. We have half of the top floor of the library. It's really cool. Cool place to go. It's a big team now. It includes a bunch of faculty champions who bring these tools into the, into the space. But then it includes a whole set of developers, both junior developers and senior developers. Uh, behavioral scientists play a really big role in this. It turns out that a lot of education is actually about behavior change. Right? If you want students to learn more, they have to actually do something something they're not doing now, right? It doesn't just happen by osmosis, they actually have to do something. So if you're going to change behavior, you might want to have people on your team who think about how to change people's behavior, right? Very, very useful. Um, we have a lot of work going on in user experience and design, uh, visual design as well as user experience and interface design. And we've taken great advantage of the campus. So we have 15 or 20 students who are interns with us at any given time. And they come from a wide range of areas, of course, computer science and user interface design and stuff, but also psychology and art. So we have people coming from art, education, behavioral science. It's really great to be able to draw on the campus community in that way. As I said, students, very important part of our creative engines. We've been doing a lot of design jam, hackathon kind of events with students. You know what they love? It, there's two things I think that our students love about working on these projects. The first is they think they know all about it, right? They're experts in education. They're in the system. So it's not like some unfamiliar, I don't know, marketing of screws to some auto company, right? It's like something they know about. So they really like that. Um, they think they know what the problems are and how to solve them, which is good. Um, and then the other thing is if they work with us on creating a tool, the first thing we do is give that tool to all their friends. So all their friends see their work right away, which is really cool. Right? They really like that. DIG was founded to work on three projects, the Academic Reporting Toolkit, Student Explorer, and the eCoach project. But it has since expanded to, um, at this point, about 10 different projects that are all working on it. I won't talk about most of them. I'm just going to mention a couple of these projects. The point is, when we created this space to allow for projects to be matured, many new ones emerge. And each of those projects brought resources to this. That's why it grew so, so rapidly. When we think about putting data to work, I think it's important to imagine a kind of spectrum of information agency. And, and I think about this a lot as, we're, as we design our tools. On one end of the spectrum of information agency, you could you could give everyone the data and just say, you all have complete agency here. I'm just going to give you all the data. Um, that sounds great, and it is great in a way, but it has drawbacks because most people won't do anything with the data if you just give it to them, right? So if we just give the data directly to people and let them decide what to do, that may not work optimally. On the other end of the spectrum is what's happening a lot in the commercial world. You give experts the data and have them interpret it and make decisions for students, advisors, and faculty. And when I say the commercial world, what I'm referring to here is you know, Facebook and things like that, right? not the commercial ed tech world. So you could just let experts interpret it and make all the decisions for you and, and you know, not have you even know that decisions are being made for you. Ideally, I think we give the data to both sides. We have the experts help students and advisors and faculty members interpret the data. Right? They can get help with that. There's a reason for doing that. And we help to shape their decisions using behavioral science, not taking away their autonomy, 
but thinking about things like choice architecture and nudges that might help people make decisions that evidence shows are probably good for them, but that they might know aren't. Right? So you don't force someone to do a decision. You just try and make it easier for them to make the decision that might be the right one. Right? And when I think about this, you know, it's really exploded in our minds, but this has always been true. If you're an academic advisor, you know, you've always sat down with students and you have a bunch of information and you face this like, do I let them make the decision or do I push them, right? It's always been there. It's not really new. Okay. So one end of that spectrum is providing information directly to individuals and the academic reporting toolkit is our primary tool for doing that. As I said, this, there was a first version of this created around 2006, made available to a variety of faculty members and then the campus got very nervous about it. They didn't shut it down, but they didn't let it expand. And then things changed, and they were ready to build a new academic reporting toolkit, which we, we launched a couple of years ago. So ART is uh, a set of tools designed to inform your academic decisions with data. It's wide open to everybody on the campus. It starts with information about courses. So you can type in a course number or titles or keywords and search that course list. When you look at the course information, you're going to see stuff like this. You're going to see who takes this class. Um, what year, how many people take this class, what year are they in, what school or college, who teaches this class. You're going to see information about what the history of this class has been. You're going to see stuff about um, how different people perform in these classes. The idea of art was to take this stuff that was in the warehouse and give people a way to ask and answer questions about courses. All right. So these course cards, the idea that we would focus on courses first for this information, are now being joined by reports about majors. So if a student's interested in a major, they can pull up a report about that major that shows them where they stand in that major, how much of it have they completed, things like that. And it's meant to just give them information so that they can think about making decisions. There are also reports about people. There are already faculty reports that exist online. Pretty much what they tell students is this faculty member has this teaching history. It's sitting in the warehouse. They might want to know. So we, we share that with them. Tools, you know, we're thinking about lots of other ways you could use this kind of reporting tool to provide information to people. Okay. A second way to approach using information and putting it to work is to provide expert interpretation of what's going on and give advice at scale. And this is a tool I've worked on since 2011, something called eCoach. It uses computer-tailored electronic coaching. And its goal is to improve student success, but also to work on equity questions. Okay. I was able to build this tool and start working on it because we have something on the Michigan campus called the Center for Health Communications Research that for 25 or 30 years has been creating digital health coaching tools to solve important public health problems like uh, quitting smoking or controlling your diabetes or making a difficult cancer treatment decision. Those are very similar to our problems in that you have to know a lot about that individual person and you have to think a lot about what kinds of language you use and everything else. So what we do in eCoach is we aggregate all the student information we can get from many sources and put that information to work in deciding what we would say to that student if they sat in front of us. What kinds of feedback would we give them? How would we encourage them? What advice would we provide if we knew those things about them? So I always think of it as, you know, if I was in my office hours and I knew the student really well, what would I say to them? And that's what we provide in the system. There's no AI in this, it's all scripted, all written by people, but thinking about what we should say to every student, thinking about how we should give the message that we give. The message that you give to a physics student is very different if they've wanted all their life to be a physicist than if they're taking physics because they have uh, been required to in order to go to medical school. Right? It's just different, you wanna talk to them differently. We, we change also who speaks in these systems. Behavioral scientists have learned that a message given from an authority figure like Professor McKay is usually ignored. It doesn't take behavioral scientists to know that, but, uh, but it's true. You know, if I say you really need to start studying a week before the exam, students are like, nah, you don't know me. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's what happens. But if their roommate says, you really need to start studying a week before the exam, they might listen. So providing the same advice in a different voice, in the voice of an identity matched peer, can be very powerful, and these tools let us do that. What I like the most about this is this is a tool that lets us speak to students, right? In a kind of humane, ordinary way, the way I do in a, in a regular basis. Yes, it's a little more remote, of course, but it's better than just giving them a dashboard, right? It lets you communicate in human ways. So what does it look like? Um, it provides this kind of richly tailored messaging. You can see a bunch of different stuff that, that we provide to the students that's based about how they might be successful in this course. We provide them with tools like checklists about what to do, information about where they are in the class right now, all kinds of advice about how to be successful in this particular context, right? 
So we might talk to them about whether they go to lecture and why they go to lecture. And if they don't go to lecture, not say, you have to go to lecture. But try and get them to think about it, right? So, uh, so this is, this, these are examples of some of the kinds of stuff we do. How do you respond when things go badly? We have an opportunity to know what happened to every student. Did they do better than they wanted to do or worse than they wanted to do? We know what they wanted to do because we asked them. And we can respond to that in these kinds of ways. Okay. What's happening with eCoach right now this fall? It's being used for about 8,000 students in a set of these large foundational courses that I told you about. Um, we also have a coach running for all of our first year students, aiming to support them in their transition to college. You know, we all try hard to do that on our campus, but a lot of times we give people information that's really important. We do it during the summer, and then they get to Thanksgiving, and there's no one there to talk to them about it anymore. So timeliness can be an important part of this too. We have launched our first coach somewhere else at UC Santa Barbara, so we're doing this kind of small research collaboration with them. And the other thing that's happening is that this framework, which gathers all this data about people in all these classes and lets us interact with all the students in all those classes, is supporting a big research project that aims to affect, to improve these gendered performance differences we see in the STEM classes. So that's a big multi-million dollar NSF grant that is working to see if we can't eliminate those gendered performance differences. Okay, um, just to show you how that might work, what we are doing is actually what's called a values affirmation intervention. We go to students and ask them to write about the values that they have, feed them through a system that walks them through this process online, lets them choose the values that are most important to them, ask them to write about those values, and then we will see whether that kind of values affirmation intervention affects the gendered performance difference that we see at the end. This is being run right now as a random controlled trial with more than 1,000 students in each of the arms, and it's the first of a series of upcoming experiments to be delivered in eCoach. It, it helps to create a kind of learning environment on the campus. And we're thinking about how to learn to respond to student writing in all kinds of ways in these systems too. That's one of the things I'm kind of excited about. The last thing I'm gonna mention is the fact that this analysis of data has, has refocus the attention on our campus on these large foundational courses. And Michigan has just made a big new investment in working on these classes. Foundational courses, so they're the big, relatively stable ones. They're special for a lot of reasons, but one that I think is really important is that they typically serve students with especially various backgrounds. They're the entry points, so they sweep up everybody. And by the end of the class, people are, share more than they did before, right? They serve students also going to many different places. So the diversity of students is a big issue in these classes and a level it's not in other places. And so they make really nice environments for the use of, use of analytics. What we're doing is we're trying to promote an approach to teaching these large courses with multi-generational teams and a lot of role specialization, people who do course management, the delivery of instruction on both large and small scales, instructional design, thinking about the use of technology, all of those things, and thinking about instrumenting these courses for study. So this foundational course initiative promotes this kind of collaborative course design team that includes disciplinary experts drawn from the department that runs the course, but also includes experts from our Center for Research on Learning and Teaching. This group comes together into a collaborative course design team that will operate together for three years. So not for a two week design sprint, but actually for a long period of time. And uh, the university's made this big commitment to make that happen. So why is this happening now? I think there are two sides to this. For us, there's a lot of convergence that creates an opportunity for us to do the reform that we want. We're having a bicentennial right now at Michigan. The university's committed a lot of new money to that, which is a great opportunity. There's a huge national conversation about what's happening in higher ed. That's certainly helping us. And um, the fact that we teach these large courses and they're so important is a big part of this too. But the other side is that teaching in the information age lets us do something we couldn't do 20 years ago. I wanted to do this when I started teaching in 1995, but it was hopeless, there was no way. Right? Now it's, it is possible. Technology gives us tools which help us teach at scale. We can do research on this that will suggest ways courses might be improved, and the data provide us with really strong ways to test whether what we've done really works instead of doing it on uh, on kind of opinion. So what we're hoping is that five years from now, we will have a set of carefully designed and instrumented foundational courses, something like 30 of them on our campus, and that, th that those courses will reach about 25% of all student credit hours on our campus. So we'll be looking very closely at and designing and developing those in a kind of learning laboratory environment. And our goal is for this to play a really important role in establishing the evidence basis 
for teaching at scale. So that's really what we're after. And I'll just stop there and say that um, this has been a fascinating multidisciplinary adventure for me personally, and that intellectually getting to work with and think about everything from user experience design to the psychology of student behavior to the politics of privacy has been intellectually enriching, right? So doing this task is not just something we have to do because it's important to do. It's actually really fun to work on this. And if you can build an environment where everybody's pulling kind of in the same direction, I think you'll get the same kind of rewards. It won't feel like work. It'll feel like mission. Okay. Thank you very much.